So I have to say, even though I've only really released, I think, four computers total, yeah, if you're including fat stacks, uh, I've actually come quite a long way since my first computer, and I've learned quite a bit about uh, how certain things work, how to do certain processes and certain tasks, and how to design these things a little bit more efficiently. Though one of the lessons that I learned along the way was proper documentation, uh, and that actually was hammered home fairly recently when I tried to take a look at something that I did in the Blue Wave model and I realized that I have absolutely no documentation. In fact, the only documentation I have is pretty much just the instruction set, which yes, it definitely does explain what the computer does. It doesn't, however, explain how the computer does it. So um, I figured I would, you know, just try and break the streak of no videos being posted recently and try and figure out on camera how this works because in all honesty while the general idea of how this thing works is still in my head the nitty-gritty details are completely lost to me i have totally forgotten how this works so i figured we'd take some time or i would take some time to actually just figure out how this works so general process i believe in fact now might be a good time to switch over to the whiteboard go ahead and minimize that so the general layout I guess so there was of course an ALU and that I believe was tied to oh, just realized I went off screen uh, the 16 GPU uh, general purpose registers and of course the ALU I believe if I remember correctly only had 12 functions but let me just verify that and 11 functions so I'm going to go ahead and record that. Okay, so we also have somewhere in here we've got some control lines. So let me go ahead and see if we can get an idea as to what those do and where those are. And we'll just call it CMPR. We can always denote that later, of course. Okay, so now that we've got an idea of that... oh. We, of course, forgot the gated information. So this is typically what I use to denote a buffer, even though this is just an AND gate with all of its inputs tied. It's easier to draw it like this because this is more universally accepted as the symbol for a buffer. And how many control lines are we dealing with here? Well, I suppose we could just go to the decoder and figure that out, couldn't we? So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven control lines, like so. So we've got a 7-bit bus coming out with a 4-bit bus going in, and I believe this actually goes straight to the control, or uh, to the, excuse me, the program memory. Control lookup table. So we have a 30-bit lookup table here. Uh, and I, I know that uh, the address for this actually comes directly from the RAM, because I stored the program in, in, uh, in RAM for that. So we've got the the address bus right here, and this was essentially the opcode, I guess, and that came directly from this register, if I'm not mistaken, but let me just verify. It looks like you got a couple extra bits that are going off in this direction, four bits, for whatever reason. I'm curious where this is going. So it looks like this bus controls the register address for A and B, it looks like. And I believe the way this worked was um, B was totally independent, but A was the read and write address, so... That looks to be the case. So that might be something no, uh, that we should note over in our documentation here. So those, for the most part, I think come directly from, and of course there's also this information here, which I believe this is for the register read information. Yeah, so we have GPR selects uh, 0, 1, 2, and 3, and that controls just uh, the A read and the write. It doesn't look like it controls anything on the B bus. So this all comes directly from program memory, I believe. Okay, so that's coming from this bus right here, which is coming from down here. And that comes directly from here, which ends up being the output of RAM, it looks like. I think this is RAM. Yeah, this is RAM. <clears throat> so that's interesting. It looks like our, um, our register control information comes directly from RAM. And of course, this is our shifting circuits. 
We'll get to that in a sec here. But it looks like it's... Um, well, we might be able to figure the uh, figure this out. I'm, I can't remember exactly which one's most significant bit and which one's least significant bit, but opcode LSB, opcode MSB. So it looks like this is the opcode. This is the data. Let me just cross-reference that real quick with my instruction set here. So it looks like for the most part the data field is usually the registers. So add R to R adds the data in the first register to the data in the second register result, uh, result is stored in the first register. So usually it's um, register information is stored in the data field. However, occasionally I do know you can actually have the register information stored in the opcode, for example, and IR. Um, I guess it's usually just with immediate information. Yeah, because it looks like here we have or immediate uh, and immediate, uh, XOR immediate. So anytime we have immediate, that's of course going to require the data field. So it looks like the register information was stored as part of the opcode, which is why um, the those four bits from the opcode register was actually taken and forwarded over to the register information. Where did that go? somewhere over yonder, we'll find it, right here. So it looks like that's what controls that. And that allows, of course, the computer to select between whether the op information or the register information is coming from uh, the memory or the op code register. Memory to address bus, I'm not sure where that goes. So let's follow this real quick. I know I'm getting sidetracked, but I am curious. There's quite a bit that's going on, and it's going to take a while to document it, so we may as well just take our time. But it looks like this is going to the pointer circuit, which it, I think it is, I believe, oh, come on. Yeah, so this is what was used to control the position of the program, I guess, in the computer. So there were eight registers, each one, one of eight could be used as the program pointer. And as the computer moved in and out of subroutines, it would select different registers. So that was basically my stack. It wasn't too terribly powerful, but it did what I needed it to do, or what, rather what I wanted it to do. And let's see here. So it looks like we can actually send the address to that bus, or we can send it to the uh, register information, which I suppose would make sense considering that there are jump addresses where the address field is part of the data field. So that would make sense, wouldn't it? So I'll go ahead and document that here. Uh, I may need a new, let's create a new canvas here just to work with something fresh. So it looks like we've got the loot and that's gonna have a 30-bit bus on the output it's gonna take a 8-bit address bus and let's see where that's coming from I believe again that's coming from the opcode register directly but we've got the register here RAM there and then we've got the data information which is going somewhere else that address is definitely coming from here, so I think we can go ahead and... I believe I called this the program tracker. So yeah, that looks like it gets its information directly from memory, oddly enough. But I think we can draw that in. And that's coming directly from the RAM. So I may have to rename this, but let's just do this here. Three signals. It's going to be the enter signal. And it's also going to be an AND between the control loot, second control cycle, third control cycle, and fourth control cycle. Okay, so it looks like we're taking the output of the RAM before the op register going, tapping the last four bits uh, 12 through 15, checking to see if it's equal to 2, if it is, and it's either the 
second, third, or fourth control cycle, um, then RAM is disabled. In fact, I should probably denote that. There. Disabled. So this one's the user. Yes. And of course, I ran out of room here. We'll just call it fifth cycle for now. We'll call it something else later. Anyway, this uh, other signal is an OR between flag result and control loot. This one's the jump. Uh, really not sure where to put the signal here because we're kind of running out of room here. And I know this is super, super messy, but we're going to roll with it anyway. Like I said, I'll clean it up later. And it might be an idea to actually figure out where that result signal is coming from, since that's actually starting to pop up more and more often. Uh, so let's take a look at the comparator here. So the comparator, um, that looks like it's generating three signals. This, I believe, is just going to be taking two signals here. So one of these signals is like the less than, the other is the equal signal, if I remember this correctly. And I think this is the equal one. Uh, and it would basically create one of three signals with that information, one being less than, the other being greater than, and one being equal to. So it looks like we've, or I've uh, noted these, so equal, greater than, less than. <clears throat> so it looks like this signal is equal, greater than, less than, respectively. I'll probably just summarize all this for the time being, and we'll say that the ALU generates a signal, and the comparator generates a signal, and we've got the flag circuits. So we'll go back to there, and so the flag circuit's going to go into a latch, and it looks like we've also got a latch flag signal, and that's going to go into uh, an encoder, decoder thing. And that's going to go into that signal, which means we're probably we're also going to have uh, a flag select or a couple of flag select lines. Okay, so the third cycle and latch flags that should be easy to figure out. So these are going to be the fun ones. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on here. <clears throat> but it looks like the first thing that I can write off the board is we do have the result signal coming in. Uh, so we've got those. We've got call and return. So these look like they're control signals. I'll bet you anything they are. Oh, you bet you, don't you know? My inner Minnesotan's coming out. No, they're not. Oh. So this one looks like it's um, cycle two, or the second cycle, interestingly enough. I do remember something along those lines where um, I needed to perform calls and returns upon certain cycles in order for everything to work properly. Um, but call, I guess that happens on cycle two. Return, I'm guessing, is probably also a cycle signal, but it's probably going to be a different one. Yeah, so that's cycle four. So this one is the call signal, and that's an AND between result, uh, cycle two, and enable call. Let's go ahead and record that. We'll just do something like this. You know, come to think of it, I think, where is the latch signal for this unit here? Um, because jump doesn't exactly have a cyclic assignment, does it? Uh, it just kind of happens, doesn't it? Uh, so we have results, we have enable jump. But I don't see any cycle. Like, there's no cycle that specifically enables jump. So here's what I'm wondering. 
is this is the right signal for the registers, of course. I'm wondering what triggers this. It still doesn't quite make sense, uh, the fact that jump is non-cyclic, but I guess it sort of makes sense, considering the fact that the information of the instruction would already be saved in the opcode register. Uh, the jump can pretty much happen whenever, and then as the cycle repeats, it'll execute the appropriate instruction. Because the jump's not going to have any more cyclic information encoded. Yeah, I can't say I fully understand why I chose to do it like that, but I'm sure the answer will come to me as I continue to dig. So you've got the set, which is controlled by the user. Um, it's actually controlled by a number of different signals, but we'll get to that as we get to that. Uh, the other signal, the reset signal, looks like it comes from the reset of the counter itself. So if the counters, well that's interesting, if the counters reset, the clock is reset as well. Not sure why that's the case. But it looks like we got a couple different signals that are actually running that. So here's what we'll do. We'll actually um, we'll just start the clock and see what happens. Hmm, interesting. Cycle one. Oh. So cycle two isn't actually cycle two, it's more like cycle three. Interesting. And that reset signal is controlled by... Looks like a number of things. We've also got another de uh, decay circuit here. Not sure what that's supposed to do. That looks like a disabler for cycle 5. So when we reset, it's disabling cycle 5 for whatever reason. Yeah, so if I had to categorize this, we basically have um, what looks like two reset lines coming in. Uh, the first one, of course, being the reset line itself. Uh, which is coming from the reset signal here. Oh, come on. Uh, and then the other one, of course, being uh, the reset line from the step button right there. So, uh, we could figure all that stuff out, but uh, probably going to save that for the user interface portion of the circuits. Okay, so there's our cycle decoder here, and of course, we've gone to match it up with what we've seen happen, which is the zeroth cycle triggers the first, second to the second, fourth to the third, sixth to the fourth, and seventh to the fifth, if that makes sense. Now, this signal kind of perplexes me. So, this goes to a number of different things. I think we've actually encountered this once before. Not sure where this is. That's the bus refresh. Okay, so it performs, it looks like it performs a bus refresh on the clock edge uh, on at the beginning of every cycle or every instruction, which I guess would make sense. Uh, but it also seems to go this way, which this I believe is actually the latch. Latch for the opcode register. Which it is. Okay, so we've encountered that before here. Um, we said it was on the first control cycle. I suppose that isn't technically accurate. We'll just call it write up for now. So then write up should be defined uh, by what we see here, which ends up being uh, the clock signal and the first cycle. And this actually reminds me of um, sort of the technique I used to build Skittle Bits, too, uh, with a central control system that created just a crap load of timing signals. It really isn't the best way to do things. Actually, now that I've managed to color 
some of the wires here to uh, to denote that I've already checked them. Uh, it seems that jump actually is. Uh, looks like it is actually timed. Uh, here we can see one of the AND inputs that I missed to the jump, and that actually, if we were to follow it, um, if I can color it as we're going to, uh, you can see it actually lines up with uh, this line right here, which I've already marked. Uh, and that actually goes to cycle 3. So that actually uh, can be marked then. Of course, here's our... Oops, Here's our AND gate for the jump, uh, so we're going to have to try and squeeze that signal in there. Oh, let's try and make that a little neater. But that's going to be the third cycle. So of course going back to the schematic, uh, we can see that we've got uh, the AND gate connected to the seventh cycle, which I guess, or the seventh um, output of the decoder, which is the fifth cycle, and that's connected to an AND gate. And if we go back to Minecraft here, uh, that's basically this right here. So uh, if we were to follow this, this is actually connected to uh, through a decay circuit through to the reset. So if we were to go back over to the schematics, uh, we could actually tie that to the stop clock. Uh, the other thing, of course, is the fifth cycle <coughs> is connected through an AND gate to the reset as well. So we've actually got two, and let me go ahead and turn this wool thing off first. So we've actually got two reset lines, as I've said before. Uh, the first one, I believe, let me just triple check. Um, this is purely a reset line, or comes from a reset circuit of some kind. Uh, the other one, let's see here. Oh, well, it looks like we've actually got another one. Oh, no, wait, this is part of that. Uh, so when this is, let's see here. So this is just one giant AND gate, uh, requiring that this be off, this be on, and this be on. Which, again, this is going to be the step circuit. So it looks like so long as the step circuit is on, uh, once the clock cycle reaches that, in fact, we could probably test this here. Let me go ahead and grab, turn the clock on. And 7 should enable this. It looks like it did reset. That was a little bit too quick for me to catch, though. Interesting. So I'm not sure if I caught that, but it looks like... Yeah, so it looks like uh, that's actually not long enough to really control it. It's almost as if that's not even connected. In fact, I'm pretty certain if I were to disconnect that, it would still work the same. Yeah, it works the same. I'm going to leave it in there just for the sake of consistency, but otherwise, I'm going to say that that's really not necessary. Nonetheless, uh, if we were to go over to the schematics, we can actually record our little finding here. And that goes to... Clock stop. The other thing that's interesting is uh, this cycle three, I believe it is. Yeah. So this seems to be going to something else here as well. I'm really not sure what this is, but it's also taking a direct line from the control loop and controlling this line. Uh, but this seems to be taking some information from something else as well. Oh no, this is the control. So it looks like it's taking information from the control uh, control board, more specifically from this right here, which I believe this is um, one of the port modes. 
And it seems to be going to... Let's see here. Oh, nope, that's an input as well. Okay, so it looks like it's taking a bunch of information and adding it all together from the looks of things, or at least that's an OR gate. And then an OR with that. And that goes all the way down here to... I believe this is the right, but I could be mistaken. So port mode um, is an AND between cycle 3 through a rather large delay and an edge detector. So large delay, edge detector, then to port 3. Or port mode, excuse me. Uh, and that's also controlled by this guy. So let's go ahead and go over to the schematic. And then we've got this mysterious input, which is port mode. And I believe that's an AND gate, but let me just make sure that that's not like a NAND. So this comes in through a NOT, this comes in through a NOT, and it goes out to a NOT. So this is, in fact, an AND gate. We've got that input there. We've got that input there. And we'll just call this um, third cycle post delay. That's going to be going off screen, but that's okay. And we'll call this one control loot port mode. And it looks like It gets its signal from a couple different places, so we'll just add this, but one of them is always off. So it's inverted. So if the port reset comes in, it's going to disable this two-way buffer, uh, regardless of what this signal is, because if this is on, this is off, and this AND gate is no longer allowed to work. So the two-way buffer will cut the data, uh, allowing the port to reset. So it might be an idea to get an idea um, to get an understanding of this circuit right here. So the toggle port mode is going to come into here. It's going to toggle this, which is going to go into a decoder. So let's let's record this as well, because this is actually something that's useful. Kind of uneven, but that's alright. Okay, so this is getting reset by something. And it looks like it's 0, 1, 2, 3. looks like it's the last one. So the last cycle resets the counter. Is there anything else that resets this? I can't imagine that would be the case, but let's see here. Doesn't look like it. Okay, so then the only ones we're dealing with is cycles 0, 1, and 2. The API interface, 9 buttons... Toggle port mode. Toggles the port mode between automatic input and output. Input and output have already been discussed. Port must be an automatic uh, when running the program. Data I.O. is the lower eight. Blah, 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 blah. Computer can also use data I.O. to display data. The ports must first be programmed to be either an input or an output. This will be explained further in programming the computer section of the manual. Oh, wait. It's discussed later on. Which I don't know. Yeah. I'll have to rewrite this at some point. Uh, if the light is blinking, the mode is automatic and the computer has full control over the port. Port mode must be automatic uh, when running the program. If the light is solid off, the mode is input and you may feed data into the GPRs through the I.O. port. If the light is solid on, the mode is output and you may request data from the GPRs. The data will be presented through the I.O. port. So I know for a fact that this is automatic. Okay, so that's off. So now it's in uh, input mode. Input. So we'll toggle the port mode indicator again. So now it's on. Output. Okay, so obviously... Um, 
this is going to control the select A and select B. Uh, so if we were to go here, that's basically just going straight to that. We still need read and write um, lines, though. So we've got three of those. And we've got write, read A, and read B down here. So I'm guessing these probably go straight to the control unit, but I do want to verify that. And it looks like, yeah, read B, read A is all there. I don't see a write, though. A write is the one that perplexes me, though. Where does this go? So it looks like it's an AND between cycle 3, again through a delay, and a control line. GPR write. Yep. So, yeah, we can see that the registers, uh, their write signal is controlled by a uh, control line from the control loot, uh, as well as the third cycle after the delay, with another delay, uh, or it's through a manual write. And the manual write uh, is actually, let's see here, actually comes from this circuit right here, which is a little bit more complicated. I mean, it's not too much, but it's, it's going to be taking um, <clears throat> a mode from the port mode indicator, uh, as well as a control line from the user to generate that. So it's nothing too terribly complicated, but I don't think it belongs logically in this group. Yeah, I really don't like the way that my control system is set up. It, there's no... Um, I guess in programming, uh, this would be equivalent to spaghetti code, where everything is kind of connected to everything else. It really isn't clean. There's no uh, clear separation of um, of roles, I guess. Uh, so you there, there's no um, clear distinction between what's control and what's execution and what's memory, and so it's it, it's it's a little bit of a mess. Uh, and my hopes is to try and clean this up just a little bit. I suppose technically this could move up that, um, yeah, you know, that that might be what's, uh, yeah, that's definitely what's happening. Okay, so it's a bit of redstone trickery is what's going on. So this, um, this signal right here, the one that comes from this for stop clock should also reset um, what does it reset because it's sending its signal up uh, and it's going in there looks like it's just resetting this it's a good thing I checked this because this this is um this is what I mean by like really messy wiring is stuff like this can be hidden from you if you're not careful. So it looks like we've got everything here. So uh, I'll tell you what, it looks like since we've got everything figured out, I'm going to take some time and I'm going to clean up these schematics uh, and we'll go over everything once I've got it all cleaned up. Okay, and so after a few days of uh, going over the schematics and trying to sort things out, I think I have a fairly um, understandable representation of what's going on in Blue Wave here. So we'll start here with the uh, functional block diagram of the execution unit. So we can see that, um, of course, we have the registers, the ALU, the digital comparator, and the flags. This is all connected to the uh, bi-directional bus, which is indicated by the green line there. Uh, and they, of course, have their own um, control points, I guess. So we have the um, bus to registers, the register to bus, uh, bus to ALUB, and the re uh, ALU result to the bus. Uh, we have the port connection. Um, and then we have the, I guess, the data and program flow section over here, which is a little bit more complicated, uh, but it's still fairly straightforward. The program tracker, since it's address to the memory. The memory sends its address to this bus right here, which it then gets diverted to multiple points. It can go to the bi-directional bus. Uh, it can go to the um, register selection address over here, but only the A1, the B1, um, or I'm sorry, it goes to A and B. Um, the A can also get its information from the user or from the opcode register, which uh, this bus also ends up going to as well. It can also send information back into the program tracker as well as the user. Uh, user can also enter information into the memory. 
Uh, but this has to be disabled when that happens because there is a write back loop with this shift register over here. So nothing, <clears throat> nothing too terribly complicated. Uh, the complication, I guess, starts when we go down here. So from the op register, uh, it can then go down to the control lookup table, which is going to translate the 8-bit uh, opcode into uh, 33 or 32. Uh, that actually should be 33. Um, I'll have to change that at some point. But um, it translates the 8-bit opcode into uh, 33 control signals or control lines, I guess, and those control lines go into the control unit, uh, where the control unit will take that and the user's control information to generate uh, 40, or sorry, 39 control signals, which get distributed all throughout the computer to the various um, data flow points, as well as the read, write, and reset signals for all of these components over here. So uh, we'll turn that off and we'll turn our attention to the control unit. now. The control unit, um, also I did my best to try and simplify things. I actually wanted to try and separate the user's control from the computer's control. It's so tightly integrated into it that I really couldn't do that. So here we have all of the, um, the user control inputs here. Uh, we can see that they primarily, uh, these controls go directly into the control matrix. Uh, these ones they actually end up going into the port control mode or port mode control um, which is used to control the flow between the registers and the IO uh, and then these ones just control the clock so they go to the co clock control which controls the timing generator um, and then the timing signal and all of these signals go into the control matrix now the control matrix is going to take timing information and control information as well as the control lines and modify them and generate new ones, of course, because we've got 33 lines coming in, 39, actually 42 lines, because there's three here as well. Uh, so 33 lines coming in, 42 lines coming out. So it's generating a number of signals as well. Uh, but all of those, um, it basically takes these lines and modifies them based on the timing and based on the control uh, and spits out uh, basically new lines for all intents and purposes. Uh, but we do have some feedback. We've got the bus refresh here. We've got these two lines which come back here. This is the reset step and the stop clock. So that those two signals are actually generated in here. And uh, we'll get to all this in a sec. Now the, the clock control and the port mode I think we've actually covered already. Uh, I basically just um, copied those schematics directly from what I drew earlier. So here's the clock control. Nothing too terribly fancy. It's basically just an RS nor for your step. You've got an OR to actually start the clock, and you've got a um, sort of a pulse like thinner circuit for the reset. So it's not that complicated. Um, then we have the port mode, which we've already gone over this. Counter goes into decoder. Decoder does different things depending on what buttons are pressed and what state it's in. And it generates signals like um, manual read, manual write, configure input, configure output, and configure automatic. Uh, so we'll go ahead and turn those back off. So timing generator, I think we've also covered, but just in case, I should probably move that over. Oop, my mistake. There we go. So timing generator is also not that complicated. Um, you've got the start and stop signal, which uh, trigger, uh, starts or stops an RS Norlatch, which runs the clock which increments a 3-bit counter, which goes into a decoder, which generates the timing signals as well as a clock signal. So nothing too crazy there either. Um, the craziness happens down in the control matrix, and I'll actually show you why that is. So here's the control matrix. And like I said, it's um, it looks a little bit overwhelming, but the, the basic premise is um, here's your... Oh, i got to stop doing that. So here is your uh, signals from the control lookup table. Some of those signals need timing information. So we've got timing signals up here, as well as the result signal, um, which I suppose I actually forgot to draw that in in the um, schematic, this reset signal going from the flag circuit to the control unit. But it's not that complicated. It's just a direct signal from the flags. So the result comes in, you have your timing information, um, and those between that and certain control lines is used to 
generate uh, timing-based signals. We've also got some stuff down here. This is your generated signals. This is actually for the bus refresh and the instruction register write uh, or the opcode register write. Uh, but basically, um, case in point, we'll take one. Uh, you've got your latch port. Um, latch port would normally go through like any of these other signals, but it can't unless cycle 3 is active. So there's just a lot of these uh, logic gates that um, dictate when certain signals can be activated and when they shouldn't be. Um, and of course some are more complicated than others. Most of them are just AND gates, basically just saying it's not going to be active until that timing signal is applied. Uh, others are a little bit more complex, like the enable increment here um, is enabled on cycle 5, uh, but it's also kind of overwritten if there is no result. Uh, and then the other one, of course, is the read RAM or not read RAM, uh, which is always on uh, unless this not read RAM signal is active and it's either cycle 2, 3, or 4. Uh, we covered this already. Next half of it is the control. So this is where the user can actually override some of the signals that are coming in. So normally these signals would pretty much be controlled by this and maybe some of the timing. Uh, over here the user can actually inject certain signals uh, and override them. So you can see it's mostly just OR gates here. So port latches on uh, if the port latch signal is coming in or if it's a manual read. Uh, or if it's a configure automatic. So you can see that uh, as different signals come in, signals over here will get overwritten. Um, and then of course there are some more complicated ones down below, of course. Um, a lot of them, again, have to be generated. So uh, these ones from this point on are all generated, whereas this, uh, these two are basically just the negation of certain inputs. Uh, this is probably the most complicated part right here. And that's because this is actually what's, um, uh, let's see here. Uh, these parts um, are for your clock. So for your, this is to start the clock or stop the clock. This is to actually reset the step and they're tied together. So we could have made a one line, but I want, I wanted it to be a little bit more discreet and explicit. Um, and then of course, if you remember in the schematic, the bus to IO, gate is disabled during a reset, so that's what this line is for. Otherwise, uh, this is pretty much just controlled by bus to I.O. and um, these two signals, which I believe are configure input and configure output. So that's pretty much enabled if you're in configure input or configure output mode, of course, or if the computer is actually trying to do an I.O. read or write. So. Again, not too terribly much. You can study this more closely if you'd like just by pausing the video. Otherwise, um, control signals come in, they get tweaked by the timing, they get overwritten by the user, and control lines come out, which then in turn control various points across the computer. So that is pretty much everything that uh, you can figure out about how Blue Wave works. It's not too terribly complicated. Like I said, this was my first computer. The only uh, the only complications that come in is because I didn't exactly know how to plan these things at that time. So of course everything was kind of made up as I went along. Uh, but now that I actually have proper documentation, I think I might actually go back and uh, rebuild it and try and make it a little bit smaller, a little bit sleeker. Uh, but that's that's we'll see about that. We'll see where this all goes. Anyway. This is just a fun little tidbit project that I wanted to try and do, and I figured I'd share with you my progress, so hopefully you enjoyed, and thanks for watching.